of our Strategic Leadership Institute. We want to welcome each and every one of you again to our virtual leadership foreign space. We're ex so excited tonight to have with us Dr. John Sibley Butler. Dr. Butler is well-renowned. Uh, he is considered a mover and shaker in the leadership and entrepreneur space. So at this time, without any further ado, yeah. Dean Andrews, the <laughs> Dean of the College of Business, will be introducing Dr. John Sibley Butler to the group tonight. Dean yeah. Andrews. Well, good evening, everyone. I'm glad to see everyone here tonight. I think we have a really uh, nice He clearly doesn't know me in real life. All right. Here tonight. Hello, jobs and shit. Very great uh, program. Uh, we have Dr. John Sibley Butler. Uh, you, that is, man. Of Franklinton, Louisiana. Now, if you don't know where that is, that's over in Washington Parish. Uh, John, more or less, is... Uh, uh, grew up in Washington Parish. He was a member of the band. He was a Boy Scout, Little League baseball player. Uh, he spent a lot of time here on the Southern University campus when he was growing up. He's a 1969 graduate of Louisiana State University. He's a 1974 graduate of Northwestern in Evanston, Illinois. That's not Northwestern State in Louisiana. That's Northwestern in Illinois where he received his uh, PhD uh, in the field of sociology. Uh, he was a fellow in social change. He's taught in the MBA programs in Mexico as well as Japan. He's the founding editor of National Journal of Sociology. In 1988, he was called to UC, that is University of California, Berkeley, in terms of a think tank on teaching and American organization. Some of his accomplishments as a professor at University of Texas, Austin, uh, the J. Marion West Chair on Constructive Capitalism, the director of the IC Square Institute, which basically was Institute for New Venture Creation, the Herb Kelleher Chair in Entrepreneurship in Business. For those of you who don't know Herb Kelleher, he was the founder of Southwest Airlines the Sam Barshop Research Fellowship, the Dale Rawls Regents Professor in Ethics and American Society. He served on various boards, including the Morehouse Research Center, Langston uh, University National Institute for Study of Minority Enterprise, and the J. William Phil Fulbright uh, Scholarship uh, Board. He's received awards, including the W.E.B. Du Bois Excellence in Research Award, the Booker T. Washington Legacy Award. In terms of his books, uh, which he may talk a little bit about tonight, his entrepreneurship and self-help among black Americans, a reconsideration of race and economics, all that you can be, black leadership and racial integration the army way. He's also written in terms of immigrants and minority entrepreneurship the Continuous Rebirth of American Communities. I first met John back in 1995 as a Nissan HBCU fellow, and he, that program took place in 1995 at Tennessee State University. He made an overwhelming impact on the Nissan fellows in terms of bringing to them information in terms of what has taken place in terms of self-help among African-Americans. He's also been a consultant to the uh, various corporations, including State Farm Insurance, uh, the Department of Defense, uh, and he basically preaches and lives entrepreneurship. He's also served the U.S. as a decorated Vietnam veteran. So I give you Dr. John Sibley. Thank you very much, Dean. No. Thank you very much. Let me see, say what a pleasure it is to, to, to be here to, to talk about with you. Uh, leadership is everyone's business at uh, Jaguar Line uh, Southern University. Um, I, uh, my, my mother and father uh, are graduates of Southern. I have a, a brother graduated from Southern, sister graduated from Southern, sister graduated from Dillard. So as, as the dean said, I, I grew up sort of on campus uh, as a kid. 
What I want to do is talk tonight about leadership and economic development. You know, uh, as I look at all the leadership stuff I've done, and I wrote the manual for leadership for the U.S. military that became a, a policy, by the way, it's called Leadership, Cohesion, and Values in the Military. So the first thing I want to do is just talk about what I plan to do tonight, <clears throat> that is define leadership in terms of economic economic behavior, and, and then really look at how in, in these leadership our classes, people like to know something about you. So I have some, I have chosen some slides that talked about me, who I've met, and all of the leadership values that I really learned from them. But let me just talk about uh, distinguishing the different types of uh, leadership. I have one of my favorite books here. It's called Better Under Pressure here. And it's, it's by uh, Justin uh, Meekins. But most of the leadership books is about what I study, organizational science. So I go to, to NU, to Northwestern, to, and I went through that, uh, that sociology business program at Northwestern, uh, studying new venture development and also studying organizations. And what I learned was that we have really embedded the idea of leadership in organizations. And so, you know, when you look at the, the scope of leadership under pressure, of what it really means to be a leader. You start with military organizations. So at one time, here's a great case as we go from regular leadership to economic leadership. If you're ever around West Point, and at one time we tried to switch the education of officers from leadership to management, put in a new curriculum, I was involved in that at West Point and, and the Air Force Academy and et cetera but it didn't get there. And so the military went back to the whole idea of leadership. So if you look at the generals, no matter where they are from, whether they, the, the cases are from generals from China, from Germany, from America, generals in the Civil War, generals in all wars, the question is, how does a leader evolve in the context of an organization? And then you look at all of the great stuff when you move from the military in what we call organizational science and leadership, which is my, one of my core fears. So, so we look at how leadership evolved and what happens to organizations. But it's an interesting kind of spin on what happens in different kinds of organizations. For example, we had a, a great enterprise in, in Houston called Enron uh, it had some of the, the best leaders in the world, and it turned out that they ran the company into the ground. A lot of them went to jail, and some of them committed suicide. They were from great universities. And so the question was, what happened to that leadership capability? We also know that when we talk about leadership within the context of organization, we talk about organizations being under pressure. The only thing we know about a great enterprise and all the literature is that it might be here today, but it's gone tomorrow. So everybody can remember Sears and Roebuck, and now, of course, Walmart, and of course, now you've got Amazon. So there's a constant flow, if you will, of understanding how leadership happens in the context of organizations. I happen to think that the best pressure on leadership relates to innovation and entrepreneurship. I happen to think that if you look at what I will call entrepreneur leadership, and I have a concept about putting innovation and entrepreneurship at the very, very center of community. Now I'm gonna use the term very, very loosely because I think the same kind of leadership that it takes to build a great company also takes to build the Boys and Girls Club. The same kind of leadership that it takes to build a company like a Michael Dale, the same kind of leadership you need to build the NAACP. The same kind of leadership that it takes to build a Walmart or a Delta Airline. It's the exact same kind of leadership that it takes to build a university. But to me over the years, what has really stood very, very tall 
It's the idea of innovation and entrepreneurship and the continuous rebirth of cities. One of the great things about, about sociology is that the literature is so strong. If we talk about Max Weber and the Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism, we talk about George Zimmel and his concept of strangers in the 1840s. These were people who were coming to, to communities and bringing market economies or capitalism, right? If you talk about Warner Sumbo's work, the Jews and, and, and modern capitalism, if you talk about W.B. Du Bois seminal work in the 1890s, economic cooperation among Negroes. Because what we have learned over the years is this. There are certain components to leadership. And I listen to some of the classes here, listen to the great general. I always like listen to the great uh, honorary talk, the great general, who, by the way, was in my sister's class at, at Southern. Then the question becomes, how do we start to begin to talk about leadership, entrepreneurship, and putting it at the center of community. And you know, when I study that in the context of America, I have placed the idea of community development among Black Americans, contrasted with the community development with things like the Chinatowns in the early days, or the Little Italy's in the early days, of what happened in Miami in the early days. So what happens is then the leadership components will flow through, whether it's an organization, whether it's an entrepreneurial organization, but I think that the entrepreneurship stuff is very, very special. I think it's special because it really determines how cities evolved, what cities do, and the question becomes, how do communities evolve? Um, I'm gonna put the emphasis here on innovation and entrepreneurship among black Americans with a comparative component from a theoretical point of view that it flows across all different kinds of groups and indeed all kinds of nations. So I was, I was a professor in Japan for 14 summers. I was a professor in, Japan, in China for three summers. And what's interesting is the Chinese were very, very entrepreneurial and the Japanese were really, really did stuff through established kind of firms. I would always bet on China rather than Japan. And then, it, then if we look at how that leadership has evolved and how, and, have a reservation and how communities change in the context of everything, then my notes here say, you really have to understand change through the years and how people adjust it, if you will, to America in the very, very early years. What that means is this. I, I, did, I did the White House Chronicles, a PBS series uh, last week. They made a mistake of calling me and asked me to talk about a, a Black America. And of course, I talked about community building the history of Blacks with means, which we call the old Black Southern and Northern Black bourgeoisie. And I asked, what were the structures that they build? Well, it's the same way. The question is, look, who are the leaders? And how can that transformation in leadership take place today? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna juxtapose, if you will, let's call it leaders, let's call it leadership lessons of black America for a new black America. Because like America, everything that we need to know is there. So before I tell you who I am and how those leadership things ask, how certain questions are asked, let me just give you sort of a, a history in entrepreneurial leadership, you know, ju juxtaposed with the black Americans. You know, when, when, we, when we look at the whole idea of entrepreneurial leadership, then it becomes interesting that we have not celebrated the idea of entrepreneurs. As a matter of fact, if we go back in the history of America, whether it was people like my hero is Booker T. Washington, as was my father's hero, 
and my grandfather's hero. And whether or not it is the idea of what, what he did at Tuskegee, it was not celebrated. And then you go and you look at what the Fords did and the Rockefellers did, they were, it was not celebrated. So in the 1970s, we had a crisis in entrepreneurial leadership because the Ford Motor Company, Kellogg's, oil and gas were being challenged by international kinds of concerns. And our question became, how will we create jobs? If you're around in the 1970s when the Rust Belt at one time created the best jobs in the Western world, Pittsburgh, Chicago, Detroit, Cleveland, Milwaukee, Cincinnati, where everybody went to get a job, it all disappeared. So the question became, where are the entrepreneurial leaders? Well, they were not there. Because from the time I took a joint appointment in organization science with the business school and management and social, we had taught people how to fit into organizations, not how to create new organizations, or indeed not how to create new entrepreneurial organizations. And Black America, like the rest of the country, had also forgotten this entrepreneur tradition. But for the rest of the country, we went back, well, three places went back. We went back in Austin, Texas, in Silicon Valley, and 128 in Boston. And that's on the national side. I gave a talk one time at Alabama Power, and my lead discussion was this. What have we done, I'm a Southerner, since cotton and slaves. We have created four great companies. Delta Airlines, Atlanta, Georgia. By the way, I said Atlanta, but it was really Monroe, Louisiana. But it's the same family that did Coca-Cola in Atlanta. Walmart in Bentonville, Arkansas. And you know, you can look at the great company in in, in, in uh, Tennessee that really, really moved things around. He moved that to Nashville. And he said, I'm gonna take a Fred Express approach, put a federal name on it. But that's it. So why is it that 98% of all the great companies were founded in three areas, Austin, Silicon Valley, and 28, 70 years ago? If you look at black communities and leadership, I can do mathematically of how the emphasis switch from the whole idea of entrepreneurs as leaders of community, led by the Negro Business League, which had a league in every city, which we'll talk about. And it switched to the idea of Martin King and the ministers and everything changed in terms of the focus of Black America. So therefore, at one time, what we see is that the leaders for entrepreneurs. Certainly when I grew up, whether it was at Coverton, Slidell, or, or Franklin, or, or Amit, it was the entrepreneurs who were the leaders. So what I want to do tonight, start with, is to really look at all the things that were taught to me, and you learned something about me, and the crisis that people went into. And you know, it's like, I like Honoré's presentation because it's things that myself I have experienced and people that I met. That is, who, who, who shaped my leadership approach? When I say shaped it because as, 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 you know, as, as people who learn things, we all shape and it, it, it continues to have a big impact on how I think about things. And these will be leaders who face crisis and as we do this introduction, the greatest crisis in America, not a political crisis, although it's, it's kind of trashy now, is where would people work and where would their children work in the changing business models. So before I go to tell something about myself, are there any questions anywhere? Okay. 
Well, let's go ahead, uh, Dr. Jackson, and, 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 and see how you can, oh my gosh, what a pretty guy. <laughs> we should have taken that one out. <laughs> yes, sir. I, I think I, I, I think I got the hair. But <laughs> well, that's when I came into the world in New Orleans. All right, let's move quickly. <laughs> quickly move, right? That's my family home where I grew up in Franklinton. That's where I went to college. And what are some of the leadership that's going to graduate school? Let's keep going. We're going to do this fast. That's why I'm a professor. And now we get to, I was alumnus of the year, went to the Hall of Fame at my alma mater at LSU. And here are the leadership lessons. Okay, good. This is the greatest man who ever lived, who helped to put together a community called Southern Heights. Uh, we had the land that was farther down that was purchased from the airport. It is my father, T.J. Butler, a Southern University graduate, went to graduate school and other places, but you can see he has on his gold shirt there to represent Southern University. And there were lessons that we learned that have really, really, and it's going to really influence the entrepreneur. Everybody I show is very entrepreneurship in their own way economically. So what are the lessons quickly, uh, Dr. Jackson? Can we move on here? Next should be the lessons from that, right? Well, let's go backwards. Let's go backwards. <laughs> okay, here we go. You know, I won't read those to you, but if you can think about the economic lessons of entrepreneurs, because economic leadership, whether it's Gaston in Alabama, in Birmingham, and we'll talk about him, have always stood on the idea of truth and the idea of courage. All right, back it up, back it up. Courage being, right? Contagious, taking a stand and leading us. And when you go out to play pastor, make sure that you own the pastor, okay? So what I'm saying is, you know, uh, I consider uh, my father my best friend, uh, was my best friend, and I leaned on him when I was in leadership positions. But if you look at what other leaders and what other people have talked about, the whole idea of courage is contagious in an economic area. All of these things really, really apply. When a brave person takes a stand, the spines of others are also stiffened. Now, when we relate that to, which we'll do in the, the economics idea, the idea of building a Southern Heights or the idea of building a Gentile, right? or the idea of building a South Baton Rouge was a great community at one time, all done by entrepreneurs. You look at, I can tell you the history of Maximilian Street. I can tell you that where the, the dome now sits in New Orleans was all black enterprises. And I can tell you that at the very, very center of everything was entrepreneurs. When we go to the building, I can tell you all about living in Felton Clark's house when, when I was growing up. It kind of was real in Dr. Clark's house, right? I can remember him talking about his father, you know, that J.S. Clark, the high school in New Orleans, was his father. And that lesson was an economic lesson, and it was an educational lesson also. So you know what I, what I like here is that the spines of others are often stiffened. And so that study, what I want to do is really, really, you know, look at these lessons and you really see them when we get to black enterprises in the next slide. Okay, uh, Ron, let's get through this fast. My mother, I got to have my mother in there. That's, that's Janet Mae Butler, also a, a, a Southern University grad. Uh, now, what's interesting about this slide is you go back historically, you go back to Booker E. Washington's research, you go back to, to uh, the great, the best book ever, The College Bred Negro, 1911 by W.B. Du Bois. Now the great relationship between entrepreneurs and the education of children. I'm gonna say that again. If you look at how black America started in terms of education, if you look at Du Bois' work on the College Bred Negro, 1911, 
it was all about how entrepreneurship was for children. And the, and the reason was there was nobody else who would pick up the slack, right, uh, to do that. Okay, we're going to move on here. Uh, this is a great guy. This is a, this is a pro golfer. His name is Jack Nicholas. I played two or three rounds with Jack Nicholas. Look at the lessons. You know, I asked these guys about uh, uh, the entrepreneurship stuff, and then I transposed them in my lectures on, on economic uh, development. And this is all entrepreneur. Nobody ever drowned in their sweat. The only place where success comes before work is in the di dictionary. <laughs> And luck is what happens when preparation, preparation meets opportunity. And I use these in my entrepreneurship classes. Okay, so again, if when I look at all of the great books on black entrepreneurs, which, which we'll talk about, and as we as we draw out these lessons, then you're gonna find that they're really related, you see, to things that's outside of the box. So when I teach a regular management class, it's about fitting in. All right. It's about make sure you understand all of the rules of the company when you get there. Don't try to take over the company. With the entrepreneurship economic stuff, let's move on, uh, doctor. It's pretty interesting. Okay. The next person is a is a is a dear friend of mine who happened also to become to become a president of of the uh, of the United States, and I had a president appointment. Very entrepreneurial family but this is how I got to, to know the family. His grandfather, Prescott Bush, gave the first $280,000 to the Negro College Fund and have given $100,000 a year. Well, I had people there at that ceremony. Uh, my grandfather was St. Helena, was from St. Helena Parish, all in gas, sent his kids to college on leases from Esso. And so when I was, uh, I had I had dinner with his father, and he said he's coming to Texas to be governor. And I said, well, well I can't tell a governor anything, but I ended up being having a president appointment and writing speeches. And you're talking about pressure under fire. Let's look at some lessons after 9/11. Uh, so to me, this this was the first time, and I had a hard time with this one because I asked, what can I get entrepreneur? from the president. Well, when 9-11 hit, I was in my bed and my wife called me and said, are you watching television? <laughs> I said, no, what's on? And she said, you better turn it on. So I called Clay Johnston, who was at that time running the White House. And I was, I was running the Fulbright for America because I refused to go to Washington and be secretary of the army. And he said, well, I don't know, but I'm going down to the basement. He said, the president's flying around in his airplane somewhere. I think he's headed to Shreveport or he's going somewhere to land Air Force One, okay? So if you look at entrepreneurship, you know, when we talk about creating a company, especially creating entrepreneurial community, then there will, be, there will be thorns around all of the roses, okay? And concern should drive us into action and not into a depression. You just cannot escape the responsibility of the day. And the way of progress is neither swift nor easy. Now, in terms of pressure and sitting around, it was one of some of the most difficult times because everything essentially uh, had changed. And so, but I found some lessons about the whole idea of thorns and roses. And then if I, if, if I look at what happened to the great black community in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And I was the consultant to rebuild Greenwood, by the way, in the 1980s when it was just a shell of itself. And I worked with the Oklahoma Eagle and a great family up there who owned it. And we really, really lean on the lessons. Okay, let's get through these. Let's get through these. Next, 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 next. If you have any questions, let me know. Anybody know who this is? Anybody want to take a guess? This is a woman who wrote The Feminist Mystique. Let's look at some lessons. She was a good friend of mine. Okay. Betty Fernand wrote The Feminist Mystique. And you know, we were, we were pretty good friends in discussions about things, but she really started the, 
the woman's movement. I used to, I used to tell her, kissing her is like kissing Martin, Martin Luther King, because they both started different things in different kind of ways. But change did not necessarily assume, necessarily assume progress, but progress requires change. I'm not smart, I try to observe. Millions saw the alpha fall, but Newton was the one who asked why. And when you reach the top, that is when the climb begins. Now, again, in looking at, at when, we, when we transfer this to the, the black entrepreneurs and the, the development of, of entrepreneurial community, you'll find that every leader, you know, you go back and read, I've read everything that Booker e. Washington has written over the years about leadership. I've read lots of stuff on the Negro Business League. Because remember, entrepreneurial leadership is not, does really not have a safety net. So, so what that means is this. If I work for a company, I work for the University of Texas, and I start companies, but I will always have a paycheck. But if I started a company, I started a company, and I failed, well, then I won't have a paycheck. So the climb begins when you really think you're, you're at the top. And you know, you're not smart. You try to observe. Next slide, please, uh, Dr. Jackson. And then we, we kind of understand that. This is Carl Paul who founded Gosmith. And I put this slide in here because of entrepreneurship and family. He sold Gosmith for about 100 and, 180 million. And I was his consultant for years and years and years. And, and right now we're concentrating on his, next slide please, uh, doctor. What do you learn from Carl, uh, a guy like that? Well, you know, what, what I really got from Carl and, and it's the whole entrepreneurial process, right? It's the importance of family, right? Entrepreneurship is about being free, right? You have any kind of problems, take it to the marketplace, right? Family will last through the generations. And success should be accelerated, but wealth is a tool for future generations. Now, you know, again, and we can have the next slide to talk about this. Again, if we stop and we talk about and think about all of this, then we had, a, we had an event in, 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 in New Orleans when my good friend uh, was the governor there. And I kept trying to get a, to write a book, but Catholic, she would never write a book on innovation entrepreneurship. But as you know, Katrina was something else. And so I happened to have, of course, a president's appointment at that time, wondering why the helicopters were not in New Orleans, you know, at that time. And looking at uh, the governor of the great state of Louisiana shed tears on, on television. And, you know, I know her, I know her whole family, and a good friend of mine just married her, her daughter, who's from Shreveport. And the lessons, you know, were, were powerful, powerful lessons, okay? Because all of a sudden, as we talked about, as we talked about what was happening in New Orleans, and I heard uh, the general already talk about this too. The question is, where are the leadership books? Or, or, or the, the ancient floods that destroyed cities? Is it the flood of 1922 uh, in New Orleans? But when, it, when a city is destroyed, the, the people will turn to you and you always understand the interconnections of, of leadership. So all of a sudden, he, this is strictly in the entrepreneur process. New Orleans, as you know, uh, we lost uh, shipping to Miami. So it was a city of coming and a city of going. As a city of coming and going, the whole emphasis had to be placed on the idea of leadership. So I was a consultant for State Farm during that time. I was their major consultant one of their major consultants. I got a call from the governor, Governor Blanco. 
And she, she said, I want you to come to the Capitol and see me and the coach. I said, who's the coach? She said, well, my husband is the coach. She said, I got a big issue. State Farm is about to leave Monroe. And they provide, they provide the best jobs in the world in Monroe. It's a question of leadership. It's a question of how do we get State Farm there? Keep State Farm there. Well, I knew exactly why State Farm was leaving Monroe because of changes in technology. You don't really need to have a, you know, a, a big plant everywhere. Now they're down to just one big building in, in, uh, in Dallas. But it had to do with the idea she was so concerned and we had great discussions. It was about entrepreneurship. That is, it wasn't about the politics of schooling because schooling will flow from entrepreneurship. It wasn't about the politics of family because family will flow from entrepreneurship. It wasn't about the politics of highways because highways will flow from the taxes that people will provide. It was about how do you rebuild an entire city? What are the lessons? What can we actually do? So she buckled down and tried to understand how to bring the French quarterback. We were looking at a lot of my classmates that built houses in, in New Orleans East, which was always foolish when I was growing up. You know, once you got past the Baptist Seminar, you passed by Dillard. It was all marsh well. That was recovered by Mother Nature. So the next slide, please. So it began to bleed in different things. And this is the, uh, the mayor of New Orleans. And so he called me and he said, next slide, please. We have a crisis in New Orleans. I said, where are you? He said, well, I'm in Atlanta. And I said, well, why don't we do this? Uh, my alma mater is playing in the Peach Bowl in Atlanta, and we have a suite. Why don't you com come meet the leadership of Louisiana who will be there? He was concerned with getting the votes, if you will, back so he could be governor, mayor of New Orleans. But again, the crisis was not just a crisis in politics would also be a, a crisis in leadership and economics. So when things are over, they are over. When you are in the spotlight, choose your words carefully. Spotlight, it is difficult to look into the future when past data are destroyed. Okay? One of the most different conversations, so I don't think we watched the game at all. Everybody hollered and said, well, what is the future of New Orleans? The future of New Orleans has to be to bring the enterprises back, of course, let the water recede, make sure that the universities come back. Are you gonna, are you gonna completely do away with the charity hospital and build a complete new, new complex uh, in New Orleans? And on all, all these issues were issues of entrepreneurship. People had to be very, very entrepreneurial to solve these problems. All right, next slide, please. Let me move on, right? So what I want you to do is this. At the break, I want you to write down the people that you paid attention to that would shape your leadership style. So people would ask me, well, Dr. Butler, can leadership be taught? Experience teaches. I'm alive today because of my leadership in helicopters in Vietnam. Okay. I'm here today because of all of the people, because you make decisions. And when you get into leadership positions, you have to make those kind of decisions. So when I went to Tuskegee, I remember Tennessee State, where the dean talked about, I was talking about an area that had almost been forgotten. It had been an area that's based on everything in black America was based on leadership. So I want you to think about this. 
going in the future, what would be the place of leaders? We talk about the structure, and it's what universities do. What, what we need to do at Southern University to impact that across the state. How do we create the structures so that entrepreneurs themselves can evolve as leaders? I want to do that exercise as we go to the next slide, then we're going to call it a day, right? And of course, we will all aim high. So, so, so what we've done here, all right, uh, doctor, I think we're through with that slide. What we've done here is really laid the foundation for you to think about innovation and entrepreneurship, but it's about how to create cities. What happened to Troy? I mean, when I was, when I was in high school, right, the unemployment rate in Detroit was what? Wow. Almost zero. There was hardly no crime. Now it's falling apart. What happened to the black community? Why is the black community in Cleveland, Ohio, in Detroit, and Milwaukee different than the black community in Atlanta, and Jackson, and Nashville? What about the black community in Hampton? What's going on there? So, so, so the question that we have for leadership and entrepreneurship leadership is, 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 is a very, very interesting one. How can we create the structures themselves. So, uh, Ron, I think we need to go on with the uh, entrepreneurial leadership, right? Yes, sir. We're going to go ahead and take a quick break, and then we're going to reset. So, uh, going to take this a, wait, a, hold on, wait a minute now, uh, Dr. Jackson. Are we going to take a break? And, hey, my water's just getting hot. You want to take a break now, or you want to take a break? Yeah. Yeah, well, let's go ahead. Let's go ahead and take a break now, so they can answer the question that you uh, posed okay. to them. They can look at the people who've influenced their lives uh, during the five-minute break, and then we're going to come back and we're going to reset and be ready to move forward with entrepreneurship and leadership. So let's take a quick five-minute break. We'll be back at uh, six fifty, if you will. Uh, at this point and be able to answer the question that Dr. Butler posed. I'm going to reshare my screen again so you guys can have uh, that question uh, once and again. So uh, let me get my deck back up, if you will, and I will reshare that question for you guys. So let's go ahead and while we're taking the five minute break, go ahead and provide some context around uh, the people who have influenced your leadership style or the person that you would like to emulate. All right. So we'll be back in about five minutes. Thank you, folks. Thank you, sir. How are you, Dr. Butler? It's Sonia from LSU. I just wanted to say hi. Oh, Sonia, how are you doing? I'm blessed. I just sent Ed Watson a text message to tell him I'm on this uh, call with you. Okay. So, Sonia, I, you know, I'm on the foundation board at, uh, at my alma mater. <laughs> you are! I went, I went from the, uh, <laughs> I went, you know, we built all that, you know, that lard cooking, blah, 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 blah. Yes. Blah, blah. And then now I'm on the foundation board. Lord have mercy, help us all. <laughs> <laughs> you you will help us all, and and we thank the Lord for you. Well, I want to know that uh, Dexter Henderson had me sponsor. I had I had to. Uh, I bought all of the uh, computers for. So Dexter called me and said the football team needs some some computers. I said we got computers. He said no Southern. <laughs> I bought all the computers for Southern. <laughs> And I sponsored a golf tournament last year. Oh my goodness! In Southern, so uh, I think yes. I think they've got me. Uh, going they got to, you. They're going they got back different ways. They got you. It is it's so good to be here, and I'm enjoying your talk tonight. Well, I'm glad you are. We're going we're going to heat it up a little bit here. We're going to all your heroes are. Okay. Right? 
So what I'm going to run get my tea right now. <laughs> okay, I hope you put I hope you put your your, your influences down. I will. <laughs> <laughs> Have a good evening. Okay. Okay, everyone, we're going to start returning back to uh, the virtual space at this point, and we're going to put the question back out there that Dr. Butler posed to us around people that have influenced our leadership styles or people that we uh, would like to emulate. So we want you to just kind of open up the conversation. If you want to speak directly, you can unmute yourself. Or if you would like to place those responses in the chat, you can go ahead and start placing those in the chat at this point. Or if you want to uh, speak openly, we're going to give you an opportunity at this point. Do we have any folks that would like to share at this time? You can just unmute yourself and you can begin the sharing process. Good evening. Good evening, Mrs. Hi. Andrews. How are you? I'm fabulous. I Great. I'm so excited to see my good buddy there, Mr. Butler. Dr. Butler, how are you doing? Well, you know, as they say, I'm trying to stay alive in this pandemic. <laughs> well, you, you are alive, so that's a good sign. You look, you look like you're in good health. I'm in, I, I could, hope I am. <laughs> <laughs> well, great, great. I'm really enjoying your uh, your presentation, and I'm taking uh, pictures of each one of these uh, slides as it go because it's like, oh my God, this is so good. I have to hold on to this. Okay. Uh, but uh, the person, as I, I was sitting, I was thinking of who was most uh, 
that I admired most as I grew up and, and still do if, if a person were still living was first of all, my father, who was uh, an uh, agriculture extension agent back when I was a little girl. He went to Southern after, went to Southern after he came back from World War II, graduated uh, the couple of months before I was born. And um, he was such a dynamic, awesome man. They called him the little man with the big voice. He uh, was uh, majored in agriculture and he started the ag extension program in Point Coupee Parish. That's how we managed to live in, in that parish. But he was such a leader and he had people that were so enthusiastic. The crops uh, were, were blossoming and the children were involved in the 4-H and I, I'm, he just did so much for the community. He's been dead over 50 years and I still have people that I see as I uh, go home and visit and they say, oh yeah, you Smitty's daughter. I can tell you're Smitty's daughter. But he was, he was dynamic. He was awesome. He put together some projects, some programs in the parish that really helped progress. We, he started the neighborhood that we lived in. We were the, as you're speaking about neighborhood development, I hadn't thought about it, but they cleared out a street and our house was the first house on the street and then other people started moving in and I tell my kids, yeah, I remember when the street stopped right at a certain point, but we were the first house in the subdivision and then other houses started coming after that. The next person, and I'm going to oh, cut it short, it was uh, Emmett Douglas. Uh, he was the, the state and maybe even the national president of the NAACP when I was a girl, I was involved in the NAACP when I was 11 years old. You had to be 12 to have membership. So when I still have my NAACP card, was my first card that I um, achieved membership to. Emmett Douglas was so awesome. He was dynamic. He was outspoken. He, he believed it. What he believed in, you knew it. And he really, what I liked most about him, he put so much energy into the children because I was 11 years old and, and he allowed me to become a member of the NAACP Youth Council. And we ran the whole meetings and we had projects that we worked on and things that we did in the community, beautification, little projects, planting flowers and trees certain places, being involved when someone uh, got sick, we would put together fruit baskets and stuff like that. At that age, I mean, he, it, it did so much for me and it was such a big part of me. And then of course, back to my dad, I was, uh, my dad died when I was 12, but I could remember being his secretary forever. And he, I mean, I was 12 when he died and I had been being his secretary answering the phone That's at right. the house because he didn't have an office. So he was, he was good and a dynamic and so much I am trying to be like he was. You know, what's interesting, thank you very much, what's interesting when you study this stuff, because you get in certain situations in leadership, and you always ask that question, what would X have done? So, so if you look at, if you go, again, if you go back to West Point, and you ask, all right, what would Custard have done, <laughs> or what would General whatever had done? Because for the most part, with leadership, you are, you are creating the path, especially in what we see as what we call entrepreneurial leadership. So is anybody else do I have the need to call on somebody, Dr. Jackson? You know, I call on people. <laughs> uh, no, sir, we had a, a response uh, by Dr. Webster uh, in the chat. Dr. Webster chatted in her grandfather, uh, Maurice, Maurice uh, Rivera. Guillory. Yeah and a uh, high school business teacher, Reverend Guillory and Valerie Jarrett are some people that have okay. actually uh, been influential in her life. Well, good. I'd like to that. bring one up if you don't mind. Yes, sir. Go right ahead, Dean. I mean, you know, I'm kind of dating myself. <laughs> uh, but I would have to say uh, A. Philip Randolph. Okay really influential person. Everyone doesn't realize, you know, that March on Washington was about economics and jobs. Right, exactly. And he was basically an entrepreneur. Uh, 
he was a labor leader. Uh, he more or less uh, challenged uh, President Roosevelt. Absolutely. Uh, to, and he basically was the first to talk about affirmative action. You know, we need some affirmative action. So he Absolutely. was about economics and jobs and self-help. Right. I think that's good because what happens we, as we get into this and we go to communities and we get through the entrepreneurial leadership and get to entrepreneurship and self-help, you know, you wonder, my grandfather, Helen Articake, right. William Guillory, okay. Right. You ask how did people make these decisions, right? What is because all of the leaders, I'm talking about Black America now, from the 1700s that created and built those homes, right? Took it from an entrepreneurial leadership perspective, okay? Uh, and when, when you say that, what that means is there's a lot of stuff going on, but the, but the differences in how communities develop and what, what we need to do in the future in all America and in black America we relate to innovation and entrepreneurship. So one of the things you ask is, how could communities be so safe, like a Durham, North Carolina, which, which I kind of outlined in my book, with such a great emphasis on education? Oh, let's ask another question. Uh, where did Southern High come from? Okay. Or where did Xavier come from? Uh, you know, so, so my question is, if I look at the changes in Southern University and how Southern has changed since the 1950s, it has been a tremendous uh, kind of change. If, if you look at my alma mater and how it has changed, it has been a tremendous kind of change because we have all issues, right, on innovation and entrepreneurship. Because so now we're going to look more deeply into the things that we just looked at, bring out some historical leaders on leadership and entrepreneurship, and of course, creating communities. Now, when we say community, community has, all, has also changed, right? So communities now are not the same kind of enclaves that they used to be. So if you look at the history, and I won't go into this too much, of understanding this, you have to go to and, and, and study a community like uh, Little Italy or, or Little Chinatown, or all strong black communities that were very, very interesting with enterprises everywhere. And the emphasis was the Negro Business League all coming out of Tuskegee. Okay, so what I want to dig, dig now into is called leadership and entrepreneurship and mix in what we're doing now, I say we because I'm really involved in, in trying to create the structures, you know, for communities. And I think you got to switch back to entrepreneurs being the communities, being the leadership, leadership, the leaders in the communities. Uh, so entrepreneur leaders here, thank you, sir. Uh, if, as I said earlier, I mean, it is placed at the center of what, of what we do. Uh, the actions are very, very powerful. Economic stability and the importance of entrepreneurship in making organization a part in community development. Okay. Yeah, so I worked in Baton Rouge, uh, Baton Rouge on community uh, development. And I'm working now on community development. Okay. So what happens then is that what has happened in America that's very, very interesting is that for a bit of time that the leadership switched from entrepreneur, entrepreneurship to political leadership. Now I can tell you in the state of Texas, this, this state is run by merchants, right? And I can tell you that in the state of Louisiana is run mostly by politicians. So I'm gonna give you a crisis in entrepreneurial leadership here in, in Louisiana that I was involved with. And it had to do with New Orleans and the virus and me creating a company. 
So my next company, I, I created a company called Glowfish, which the dean knows about, and we sold it for, how much did we sell it for, dean? Ten million, I think. Try fifty. Fifty. Okay. Your share may have been ten million. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit lower, right higher. Right. <laughs> because Dean is always on me about you know giving giving to the jam. But anyway, so we had a crisis in Louisiana, and the crisis was the virus. We had had Mardi Gras. People were getting sick, and. I have a company that I started three years ago called Nuclean, N-U-C-L-I-E-N, Nuclean.com. And we started a handheld device to really, really understand so a person could do their own diagnosis with a virus. It's a handheld device. And so about March, when everybody was getting sick, right? And I swear people were getting sick before March. I know people who said, I'm sure that I had that thing. When I came from the national championship game in New Orleans, there were so many people who were getting sick. But to make a long story short, I had been working with another company, and this is not the handheld device, from the Netherlands. But we had a, we had a, uh, a phone call from Tor Taylor works in the governor's office, a dear friend who used to be mayor of Bogalusi, Louisiana. Of course, I know the governor and his family because they're from Amit. And actually the governor went to, drove to West Point with my cousin from, uh, from St. John. And so, so I said, well, our device is not ready yet, but the Dutch have a system which is now headed to New Orleans and we said, it's a place where entrepreneurship and science has to solve the problem. So all of a sudden you, you're faced there with a situation and that machine should be there and it's got like a 98% success rate. Not a lot of false positives, right? But you had to have the entire community to get behind you on this entrepreneur project. Okay? So we're going to look at, 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 at how these kinds of things require innovation and entrepreneurship and how the leaders have to step up to make sure that everybody in the community becomes a party to the entrepreneurial process. All right, next, next slide, please, sir. Okay. Look, one of the things that I want to do in Baton Rouge, who are my entrepreneurs in Baton Rouge? Anybody there are my entrepreneurs? Mary Johnson, are you going to get this done for me? Anybody's going to get this done? Okay. Yes, one, sir. Thing, one thing that I want to do is go by all of the houses that's near in Southern Heights and make them part of the hotel for Southern University. Okay. How do you empower an entire community? I want to go by the bank sitting right there outside of Southern University and make it a part of the Alumni Association. Okay? And I want to do what Booker D. Washington would have done when he went and purchased Harlem for Black Americans in New York City. We're going to create a real estate trust. Everybody's going to kick in. We're going to become very entrepreneurial. Maybe get a hundred people to put a thousand dollars in. You got a hundred thousand dollars. Or maybe get a hundred people to put two thousand, two thousand dollars in. You have two hundred thousand dollars. Because thinking and realizing how to change communities requires that. It requires an emphasis on that everyone, right, outside of where you are. Is part of the external community. Everybody's smarter than you outside of your environment. And to do that, you have to make the entire community very, very entrepreneurial. Okay, next slide. I'm going to show you one of my heroes here. Uh, oops. There we go. 
And of course, I'll just go to the light. This is my hero here. This is a guy who changed Austin. Okay. We made the entrepreneurs heroes. The whole city of Austin. When I got to Austin, no jobs except the university and state government. Now it's a very, very powerful. We did Dale Whole Foods, National Instruments, created those companies. And the next one, next slide, is my hero. And let's look at how he, he infused the whole idea of innovation and entrepreneurship. So if you look at all that research, I'll take you back to an article by a professor at, at Michigan, Margaret Levenstein, and she analyzed the census. And in 1911, black Americans were more likely to be entrepreneurs than any group in America all led by, all led by the Wizard of Tuskegee, Booker e. Washington, from Hampton. And he was the first person, he was literally the first person that took a university to make science and technology and to create wealth. So if you look at the university in Alabama, Tuskegee is number one in wealth creation just like Stanford did it with Silicon Valley. He hired George Washington Carver as a scientist. They took the peanut, created everything from products to paint. If he happened to be in Detroit and go by the Ford Motor Company Museum and Booker T. Washington is there because they painted, Tuskegee developed the paint to create the different colors of cars when Ford went from just basic black to other things. And more importantly, he founded the Negro Business League. Now go back to the previous slides about being bold, about being creative, about stepping outside of things, about really creating the future. The thing about entrepreneurial leadership is that it has such an impact because you're creating new structures and you're creating new wealth. So consequently, we ask, well, what can we learn from Booker T. Washington and Tuskegee? Dean, it is what Stanford does. It is what MIT does. It is what UT Austin does. Stanford created Silicon Valley. 128 in Boston was created by MIT. And Austin was created by the IC Square Institute at the University of Texas at Austin. So the first thing we do is we ground this leadership into an organizational structure that changes in entire culture. Now you're talking about under, under pressure. Let me tell you what the pressure was. People were coming out of slavery. There were free blacks, which we'll look at who had done great things in the North and in New Orleans. They had created structures. And Washington said, every city would have a business league. We will compete about the greatness of cities. We showcase cities, and I, and I collect all of the videos on great black cities, such as the Durham, North Carolina, is one that I have. The one that's on Tulsa, Oklahoma, after the riot, right? You go to all of the great cities on New Orleans, right? Or other cities that had the analog of who would come. I'll say Chinatown because everybody knows about Chinatown. And we call this homophily. As I said in my, in my presentation to the White House Chronicles, you gotta understand the difference between segregation and homophily. But Washington was not concerned with anything but wealth creation and business creation. And he created a system of homophily that would flow through communities create companies, create jobs, and create all kinds of great corporations. Okay. 
So in other words, we're looking at an entrepreneur leader, a hero that cross, that transcends time and space, who understands, next slide please, who really will begin to understand, right, what entrepreneurship is done, okay? Wait, back up, back up, back up. Robert Boyd, another great entrepreneur who created banks, right? And by the way, during the Great Depression, none of the black enterprises in Durham failed because everything was about leadership and entrepreneurship and everything else flowed, flowed from it. North Carolina College, which is still there, sits there. You're at Shaw University, which is still there. All held together by Booker D. Washington's greatest, the North Carolina Mutual Insurance Company. That was a multi-million dollar company in the early days. So the question is, look, where did this entrepreneurial leadership come from? Let's ask another question. How is that entrepreneurship, how is it killed? I mean, what's the difference now? I have a, I have a friend here by the name of Robert Smith. I think he's, I think the, the, uh, the tax people are after him now. He went to give a talk in, talk at Morehouse. And I think he gave, he forgave everybody's to the tune of 50 million out of their date. I said, Robert, why would you go to Morehouse when the average income is $200,000 by parents? Maybe you should have gone somewhere else. Well, Robert has a kind of entrepreneur leadership that's about serving just as Boogie Washington had. So here is Richard M. Boyd, all right? And Richard M. Boyd, as we shall see, next slide, was very, very interesting because his leadership will determine the future of banking. Okay. Here's a Louisiana woman uh, from South Louisiana who showed her entrepreneur leadership at the turn of the century. Became a great millionaire. I did a dissertation defense when they reopened her building. We went up there and a dissertation defense on entrepreneurship. We went up there in Indianapolis, sits on a great corner. It had a theater in it. It's absolutely awesome. I don't have to tell you the history of what she did. But again, it was the time of Booker D. Washington and the Negro Business League. And you became a hero by doing entrepreneurial things. So you always had this dynamic going on between politics and economics in the country as we have today, right? And innovation and entrepreneurship. The same kind of dynamic was happening to her and she created one of the greatest companies that have gone through the years right as gave people choices of how they wanted to wear their hair because they can do anything with the hair of how you wanted to essentially wear the hair now my question is this first of all any questions so far so my question is this do we talk about entrepreneurial leadership now do we teach it? What is Negro history? Is it about Madam Walker? Is it about Booker D. Washington? What it has involved? Who are the heroes now? Entrepreneur leaders, next slide please. Entrepreneur leaders like this have been replaced right, by other leaders. But she came up with the science right? That was used in Paris, by the way. And she brought it to America. And she became America's first female self-made millionaire. And everybody talked about her. She was a hero. But now, if you look at where we are now, people beat up on wealth because they're not the heroes. And remember, every day 
there are new technologies that really, really looks at the leadership. Now, before we talk about Booker D. Washington, what he did, let's go to the next one, okay? That's Madam Walker there, the next one, okay? What did she do? Okay. She had organization commitment and effort from organization stakeholders, stakeholders convinced them that they could accomplish their goals, created a great organization, promised great outcomes, and she persevered in the face of environmental change. And we got to go back and understand the help that she had to the National Negro Business League. Okay. We, we, we got to go back and, and, and ask, who are the people that believe in her? Okay. And you would get this throughout. Here's another leadership here of an entrepreneur. And that was James J.C. Penny. Okay. Let's hold it right there. Now, what we're doing is we're looking at these entrepreneurs and trying to understand what makes them go. People ask me, are they born? What? Well, one thing is the whole idea is who do we appreciate as leaders? Now in Austin, I manage and help a lot of people who sell their companies. A lot of people are shame of their wealth. Well, not when J.C. Penney was doing J.C. Penney, next slide, as we mix things in here, okay? And you will find that there is a common pattern among entrepreneurs, just as there are com common patterns among, among politicians to convince you that something will happen in the future. Okay? So let's stop and pause now and look at all of the structures that were happening here and look at the relationship between those structures and how they were evolving. Okay, any questions? I need to stop and ask any questions at all. I'm looking at the chat. Well, I usually, when I teach entrepreneurship and entrepreneurial leadership, I have a poll and I say, there's an entrepreneur on top of this poll. And then I have another poll and I put a turtle on top of the poll and ask, how did the turtle get there? That's easy. How did it get there? I got a question from Jeffrey Thomas. Dr. Butler, how are you, Jeffrey Thomas? I'm fine. A question for you. You talked about the leadership and entrepreneurs providing leadership. When we, when we look at these African-Americans from decades back, they were providing services and goods for their community that no one else would. So in our society today, how can we, what can we learn from that? Because everybody except us provides goods and services to our community. <laughs> so they, they were definitely going to be the leaders because they were helping us have better lives and making things easier. But we don't necessarily do that today. We have other folks doing that. So what can we glean or what can lesson can we learn from them that we can apply today? Because we're not quite in the same situation. Well, we're jumping ahead a little bit, but there are lessons. And here's the deal. As we said at the beginning, communities change. But remember this, that when we look at the history of entrepreneurship, that black communities serve the entire community at one time. Wall Street was replaced by, blacks were replaced by, by immigrants in New York. New Orleans was mostly black merchants, okay? So, the idea of what we call the enclave kind of tradition, as can be seen in, in uh, W.B. Du Bois' work, Economic Cooperation Among Negroes, is that the whole idea then was that you were saying that people move certainly to a community, right? Well, you, in a sense, what has happened is wealth is now being created by science and on the internet, and it really doesn't matter where you are. 
I'm going to say that again, okay? So one of the things that we've learned is like in Austin, we say, okay, we will, we will strategize locally, but we will go internationally. You will not believe the wealth that's being created by black entrepreneurs, right, in the digital age. So we had, on Black Enterprise, about 11 years ago, we had seven Black entrepreneurs from Austin, Texas, maybe it was 10 years ago, who had all had revenue of over $60 million. And we had an incubator run by, she said that she was from New York, but really her parents were from my parents from, from my mother's from, they're really from Cane River, right? And so I think you have to look at the changing nature of wealth creation. If you go back and look at uh, uh, Negro business and business education, you'll find that Black Americans per by, by Joseph Pierce from uh, Fish University. That's a great book. And I, I sort of brought it back and, and edited it. You'll find that even in the 20s and the 30s, Black Americans own about certain things community-based. They bought most of their things from, you know, from, from large scale organizations. But here's a lesson that you, that, you, that, you, that you have. The opportunities now are 90 times greater to create wealth than ever before. It's done internationally and it's done along many different lines. If you want to see an outcome, I have a, I have a student who just got tenure at Princeton, by the way, who is from Xavier University, I might add, undergrad at Xavier's name is James Todd. Write it down and go read his book who just won a big award in demography. It's called Immigration, Immigration and the Remaking of Black America. Okay. Immigration and the Remaking of Black America. 98% of all Blacks in Ivy League first-generation Africans. Ninety-eight percent of all my students at McCombs at Texas are first-generation Africans. The rest are Indians and Asians. Also, their parents are very entrepreneurial. So I think the lessons are being taught now. We have to pay attention to the lessons. So what we call community, we certainly don't have the same kind of community, but nobody does in the early days. But there's more entrepreneurship now than ever. So if you look at Bob Wilson's work at the National Center for Neighborhood Enterprise, the big, the big theoretical question is, how do you get people who have been in America for so long to go back to the entrepreneurial process, you kind of jumped ahead, but this is where universities would come into play, okay? That is, we need, we need a incubator, we need an accelerator at universities to really, really do experiments with innovation and entrepreneurship. So all around Southern University can be incubators with enterprises, learning centers with enterprises, whether they are coffee shops, you're not necessarily competing with Starbucks, but you have to come out of way with a way to rebuild, to rebuild, but you got to put innovation and entrepreneurship at the very, very center of what you want to do. Uh, let me give you another, a Miami model down in South Baton Rouge. LSU. I was on the, uh, I'm now on the National Foundation Board there. And then I was uh, on the Alumni Board there for 22 years. And the question became, how can you renegotiate, renegotiate something called Chinatown, excuse me, Tiger Town, which was going north of campus? So, well, you know, you buy up, you buy it up, People die, it was a good community, it's falling in decay, you're gonna buy it up. And they said, well, why not go down Nicholas Drive? Why not create the analog of Tiger Town like they did in whenever they did it and go down Nicholas Drive? So 
that took a certain kind of entrepreneurial drive. And if you look at what's happening at, at Rutgers, I went to Rutgers University and they did the same thing. Uh, I went there, I taught there in the summer for seven years to enhance their entrepreneurship. And we found the worst part of Newark and we put shops in and everything changed. So if you look around, I'm not sure of what's happening around uh, Jaguar land now, but it's got to be areas. It's got to be driven by innovation and entrepreneurs. When entrepreneurs come in and change the entire direction, right? of all of the shops around. In other words, it, it's going to take Dean Andrews to rebuild North Baton Rouge with an incubator and the emphasis on making the entrepreneurs the heroes. So I think that the lessons are there. I think they're moving fast. And I think that newcomers are learning the lessons. And if you look at, I have a paper on, again, on immigration and entrepreneurship, since the 1870s, immigrants have a more propensity to be self-employed. So if you look, when I say African immigrants, I mean the Nigerians. I don't mean people from other parts of Africa. I mean the Ibu. And, and, I, and uh, my Fufo in Houston has a billion dollar company, right? And that, that relationship between community building and entrepreneurship is very, very strong. So my question is, how do we get on this entrepreneurship train that has already taken off? Well, you do it by changing the heroes of celebration to those individuals who know how to create things and get things done. So all communities, right, if you look at Detroit, they're coming back. Cleveland, Ohio is coming back. But they're coming back on the back of people coming in and creating communities and creating innovation and entrepreneurship. So the spirit of the question is, okay, we did all that in the past, but the spirit of the answer is there's more opportunities now for wealth creation and job creation ever. But I think as Americans, it's difficult for us to see the opportunities. And I think it's easier for the newcomers to see the opportunities, okay? Okay, I want to get to my, let, let's move on here. I want to get to my uh, entrepreneurship and self-help, okay? I want to ask you a question, though, John. Huh? You asked about the turtles. About the who? A turtle. Attorneys. A turtle, turtle, turtle on, on the fence. Oh! <laughs> yeah, well, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna answer that. Let me answer. Tell me I how to tur answer, I can answer it for you. How, how did it get there? He got there with help. He didn't right. go by himself. Right. He got that with help, with institutional help. Right. By the way, that answer is the end of the slide. You're exactly right. Right? Right. So what we do is, uh, that's right. So what we're trying to do is, look, all of these people, well, it's Tucker, keep going there. He did a car deal. Next slide. Right? Whether it was uh, Preston Tucker, with very, very, next slide, right? Because here's the deal. We, we put all these problems to say this. Everybody write this down. Entrepreneurship solved problems. It solved problems of poverty. It's a commitment from the individuals. And how do you take a community and switch it around? Right? Uh, there would be nothing but innovation and entrepreneurship and commitment. And in America, it kind of work, works like this. Government provides the infrastructure, whether it's roads, research, innovation, and entrepreneurs essentially commercialize those things. So if you go back to, it's amazing. You look back and you say, well, how did people build North Carolina College? Well, after the Civil War, they had a lot of help from merchants, entrepreneurs. The Rockefellers not only built the University of Chicago, but they also built Spelman, entrepreneurs. Duke University was built by a great entrepreneur in tobacco who went to Princeton and they said, oh, I want to do a, put me a Duke branch up here. And they said, no, he got a, he got a black architecture, went back, stole the design from Princeton and built Duke University. The same thing happened to 
Stanford University. All right. So Stanford University, another great, right? Leland, Leland Stanford, right? Leland Stanford. He went to Harvard and he said, okay, I made all of this money and I'm an entrepreneur. I want to do something at Harvard. They said, we don't need your money at Harvard. He went back to the farmlands and built Stanford University. And by the way, he got a big an argument with my alma mater because he wanted to name it Leland Stanford University. And LSU argued that you shouldn't do that. You should just say Stanford University. So they dropped it Leland and it became Stanford University. Okay, next slide. So all of these entrepreneurs, when we get to the black stuff, because it doesn't matter the race, it's going to go over all of the situations. You're going to live and you're going to die. You're going to create communities and they're going to die. So historically, we got to figure out how to create communities in the land of the digital. And remember when I say create community, hey, wealth is flying all over the country now. It's flying all over the world now. Most of the people in Austin, Texas, have enterprises now in Silicon Valley. It doesn't matter where you are. Okay? And just go look at the number of black companies that's on the internet. And of course, it's very, very interesting because they're difficult to study, but there are ways to get to their companies by looking at the organizations and the help that they receive. Okay, so Tucker was an entrepreneur leader. Next, next slide, here's a move, right? We go through all of these things. Henry Ford, of course, an entrepreneur leader. And you, and, and you get to the point where you say, well, how can all of this be related to, to Black America? Because for every invention, I have a book where I have every invention that Black Americans have done. And I stopped, by the way, in 1900s, right? But you have to pay attention to those things. Let's do one or two or more of these slides on entrepreneurship. Then we, we want to go to entrepreneurship and self-help. Okay? Now, you're going to, what you're going to get to all of this is what's happening with family, what the children are doing. So when you study this, you have to be a leader. I tell all my students, they say, well, Dr. Bull, I want to start a company. I say, okay, how many kids you got? You're going to go home and tell you, your husband or your wife, you're going to drop your $90,000 job and go start a company with no income coming in, okay? All of these things begin to happen. And what, again, we have to do is recreate that leadership and we're going to put universities at the very, very center. Okay, I want to go to entrepreneurship step-help uh, uh, now. You know, this is a, a guy who did the Holiday Inn up in, uh, in Mississippi. But I need to get to entrepreneurship and self-help. That's enough of that. Any questions on entrepreneurial leadership? It's just a matter of thinking, and these people had the same kind of ideas that we looked at on the first slide. So, Dr. Jackson, can we go to the entrepreneurship, the next, next one in Black Americans? Do you want the next deck? Dr. Yeah, the next deck. Okay, yes, let me reshare. Okay. I'm going to stop yeah. sharing this one, and I'll reshare the other. You can go ahead and continue the conversation. I will continue. Yeah, because what, what, what the entrepreneurial leadership, because remember, in a, entrepreneurship is automatically tied to leadership. I mean, it's automatically tied uh, to leadership. And if you don't have those leadership qualities that we talked about in the first slide, it's just not going to happen. Now, I happen to think there are people who are, what can I say? They're buccaneers, and then there are farmers. It doesn't matter what you are, just know what you, what, what you want to be, okay? So this idea about teaching entrepreneurship is very interesting to me because you can teach the mechanism of entrepreneurship or as we like to say in sports, you can draft talent, but you can't draft passion. Or you can draft entrepreneurial kinds of people and teach it, but you can't draft the passion. And I think in a real sense, what, what I've had to do with my students is to recreate the entrepreneurship because colleges and universities will sap all of their entrepreneurial activity out. Okay. Is, is, is this my book or the one that I just sent you? 
The one you just sent me, yes, sir. Okay. All right. I was gonna, that's okay. Uh, can you get my slides up? You, re you remember those? The one on entrepreneurship and self help? No, sir. You have your deck. I don't have oh, that. Oh, my one. deck. I've got it, right? Yes, sir. So you gonna let me? You gonna let me drive it? Yes, sir. Go ahead and share your screen. Oh wow! I get a chance to drive. Yes, sir. All right. Yes, sir, Professor. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna drive this thing. Uh, I've been driving all day, Professor. As I asked my students, can y'all see that? <laughs> Everybody's got that. Okay. Am I doing all right, uh, Professor Jackson? Let me know now. Yeah. Yes, sir. You're doing a great job. Go right ahead. Are we good now? Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay, here we go. Now, all the things that we tried to lead up to was... Just maximize your, your day. Yeah, right here. Oh, well, you know what? I'm, I thought I did have it, but... Okay, it, it's maximized over here, it looks like. Right here, yeah. Yeah, but, it, you know, it's showing, it's showing up on my other screen. That's the problem. Okay, but we can still see it. You can still see it? Yes, sir, we can see it. Okay. Uh, okay, well, you know, I should, okay, I just hit it, okay. Uh, so what I did was, some years back, I wanted to look at leadership and the adjustment category. I want to explain why is it that you have all of these, everybody started out a little in the same kind of way, but where the hell did Donna Andrews come from? Where did it come from, right? And so I'm looking at all this stuff. We, we've gone completely away from innovation and entrepreneurship. And I wish I could see. I got it. I got so many screens here. I got it on this other big screen here. But y'all can see it, right? Yes, sir. We can. Okay, good. Okay. And this is this is my theory that came through all of this data. You know, we got 150 years of data to talk about Black Americans. So I wrote an essay entitled, The Algorithm for Black Success. And we gotta look down the future, right? Because the biggest deal in America, all America, is the haves and the have nots. It is, okay? And I'm gonna give you the Butler theory about where we are and where we need to go based on the data. And like a lot of my research, I put a lot of stuff in mathematic equations that I love to do. I put Austin, Texas in mathematic equations. But I'm gonna ask this question right here. I'm gonna tell you guys something. If your great, great grandparents were merchants, you're different today than people's great, great grandparents who worked in factories. I'm gonna say that again. Whoever lives in America, if you're black in America, I can tell you exactly where you are by the entrepreneurial aptitude of the people before you. And when I say entrepreneur, I mean farming. I mean entrepreneurship, okay? And I can tell you it's the same for the Japanese on the West Coast. I can tell you it's the same for white Mormons. But I can tell you this. Nobody did it better than black Southerners. This is one of the most educated groups in the context of America. But they did so because of their basis in entrepreneurship and not of their basis in factories. So if you look at the factory development, I wish I can get this over there. Well, it's okay. If you look at the factory development, they have different outcomes. So as I said in the program, I grew up in Southern Louisiana. Okay, okay, that's fine. We had a monopoly. Uh, you know, my uh, fathers, my grandparents had gone to college and my mother and father had gone to college. And my uncles, the Mule brothers at Southern University who were all American playing football, the Harrison through marriage, right? So what did they, what was different about growing up in, in an enclave with expectations and growing up in Detroit and going to the factory. Both are legitimate ways, but those with an entrepreneurial background, stress education, and it's true for white Jews, 
And you can really see the effect on white Mormons. With BYU and the bank that they have, it is absolutely phenomenal. So I'm looking at adjustment patterns. Problem in the data? We're going to look, okay? Entrepreneurship, okay? We're going to look at it. What happened? Okay? Why is it that Atlanta is like it is and Detroit is like it is? Okay? Why is it that Jackson, Mississippi is like it is and Chicago is like it is? Okay? Why are the cultures so different when they used to be different around universities as opposed to around factories? So what the heck is essentially going on here? Okay. Oh, here we go. Okay. okay. We need to think about what we did in America coming out of the 1970s to be a community. The class needs to think about what they did in 1865 and what they would do today. Just something that you need to think about. What would you do? How did they build all these communities? Well, you know, one thing, they were newcomers, right? And since they're newcomers, right? I mean, they're newcomers and uh, they got to live. What's the difference between living in 1865 and living now? Okay. You know, Professor, I got to have a little theory, Dean Andrews. How we came into America determines where we are today. So they said, well, our communities are different. But I'm going to tell you, the biggest enclave collective theory from all the data, it's the old Southern black middle class or the black bourgeoisie. It's still there. The value structure is gone. I mean, the value structure is there. Uh, you know, it might be passed along through different kinds of organizations. Sometimes that organization is a religious organization. Sometimes it's a fraternal organization. Sometimes it's a sorority. It's a royalty organization, and sometimes it's word of mouth. And the question becomes, how do leaders continue the case studies? All of these people right here have the same character, just, just case studies, right? Background. Now, the difference is the Black Southerns were segregated, but under segregation, that was something called a homophily. Okay? And by the way, don't tell anybody, but they were much more educated than the white population with a much value proof of education. Okay? So I had a board meeting at LSU Thursday all day. And they were telling me that they were bragging on the fact that the person was first generation, blah, blah. I said, well, you know, when I went to LSU a long time ago, most of the blacks were second and third generation. What happened? Well, they don't want to talk about the fourth and third generations. Okay. They want to talk about, okay, what about the first? Well, you got a problem, right? You got a problem. You know, you know, you know, I mean, how do you count for Nathaniel Harrison, another one of my first cousins, you know, or an Eileen Kennedy, my first cousin? I got all these first cousins, right, at Jaguar Land, right? How do you account for them? Where the hell they come from? Okay. Well, they came from the fact that their earlier parents, concentrated on creating communities around entrepreneurship, which created a different kind of value structure, a different kind of value structure. So therefore, you know, people ask me, well, how do you solve the problem of, we well, gotta go back to earlier. I mean, that's what we did in America. We went back and did case studies on the Rockefellers, on the Fords. We made entrepreneurs the heroes. Your new, your new heroes would be entrepreneurs who are leaders. That's your leadership. What do you do? Well, we talked about Boogie Washington a little bit, but let's jump down in the, in, in the weeds. Let's get in the weeds. Okay. Because everything I say, I back it up with a book. Okay. Uh, Henry Milton, also one of the founders of Boulay, 
had a book called Early History of Negroes in Philadelphia in 1913. Joseph Pierce's book, Negro Business and Business Education, and the Boy of the Negro Business in 1988. The structure's already there. Right? Your new heroes then become other people who laid the foundation, because remember, we live in a market economy. And I don't think that would change. Now, what has changed is this, right? Dr. Dr. Jackson go buy a house anywhere he wants to. And if somebody tell him no, he could sue. That's amazing. Hell, if somebody call him a name, he could sue. My daddy would turn over in his grave if he knew that somebody called me the N-word and, and, and I wasn't expecting it. Right? Because what they realize, what they begin to realize, because these are all of my heroes that you're going to see. I want to know how Jean-Baptiste de Sale became a great merchant in Chicago. Go read about him. You don't know anything about him. I want to know how Anthony Johnson, the first black man to become an entrepreneur in James Town, what the hell did he do? I'll tell you what he didn't do. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't ask people to like him. Okay. So therefore, my first lesson would come from, look, we need, we need to look at what people were doing, right? The proportion of free blacks and slaves in the U.S. 1790 and 1860. And they decided long, long time ago, it was going to be difficult living in America. And you better create communities and wealth. And remember, as Du Bois said, although free blacks were the free blacks built with the engineering firm downtown Cincinnati, they built downtown Austin, Texas, right? They built great housing in Austin, Texas, and they have a row of them right downtown, and they made a move in 1927, right? All right. So therefore, you look at yourself, well, what the heck did these people do? How did they accumulate wealth? We need, we need to understand this history. Right? I mean, I'm a product in a way of the civil rights movement. You know, I was, because I'm from Washington Parish where we armed ourselves and created the Deacon for Defense. You know, rather than, uh, we did not believe too much in the, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, turning the other cheek. Where I'm from, everybody was always armed. So they created, when O'Neill got shot, they created a Deacon for Defense and literally went after the Klan. Right? So I was at home and I said, we're going to celebrate Birmingham. I said, we don't separate, we don't celebrate a 50 year old ass whipping by getting you turning the other cheek. There's something else in Washington Parish. Always have been. Always have been. Okay? So therefore, you look at what the hell is going on and I want to know what did my heroes do? I want to go read Juliet Walker's book where she just lists all the black entrepreneurs. And then I want to know what did people do in the face of all this damn hostility? What did they do? Well, the first document that we have, how much time I got, boss? Uh, you probably got the 11, 12 more minutes. First document that we have is Philadelphia in 1838. Oh, no, everybody should read that. Right? That's your heroes. Every little bit helps, but this is your heroes, okay? They were doing what everybody else was doing. Okay? They were doing all kinds of trades. They were very, very entrepreneurial. Right? Dyers, sorcerers, glass paper makers, hairdressers, sail makers. The person that made the sales for ocean going font fontano, black guy. We need to know that. The material progress in Philadelphia. What were they doing? 
So the entrepreneur leadership, right, came out in the in the face of hostility. Not allowed to invest in the stock market, right? But persevered by going on in Cincinnati. And remember, in 1835, the black entrepreneurs who did all the restaurants in New Orleans and in Cincinnati. You need to know that, right? We need to understand, basically, that in, in Louisiana, right? There were free blacks, there were boat builders, there were inventors, and in Louisiana, in Cane River, which is where my family's from, there were 3,777 slave owners in America who were black in Louisiana alone in 1830. We need to know that. We need to understand what happened is when they took us from, you forced the enterprises to move from the central district, district you developed, as the question said, a market for black Americans only, there was a decline in enterprise, and they tried to move from the, from the marketplace, right? But Boogie Washington stepped in and said, we're going to have another strategy. We're going to seek for ourselves. Okay? And, the, the, and, and, and you know, religious institutions, we're working on religious institutions. Look at the AME church. All those churches used to send money to universities. Now they're closing. You got you to re, regather that kind of relationship. All the development of all these things. So what we're doing is to seek for ourselves. You created all of these organizations that were powerful and maintained where you went. Everybody knows Richard Allison. Found AME Church. Founded lots of AME schools. Right. Great value property, and created all kinds of schools. Would you look at this, white, white Southerners in no history of education. The oldest college in Austin is Houston Tillerson, not the University of Texas. By the way, University of Texas was created because the students at Houston Tillerson wanted a white school to educate whites after Civil War. You want to see who they are? Y'all, you guys have heard of them. It's the Baptist Church. Okay. Just put some in there. Arkansas, the problem, let's, let's go down to the great state of, of Louisiana, right? I mean, they created all these things, right? I kind of jumped over Louisiana, right? I think I took it right. Well, my point is, is that they were under something called an economic detour, and every state had a business league. And this is a study of Joe Pierce and the study of enterprise on economic detail. Now, what are we saying here? Let's look at metrics, Washington's leadership. Okay, we already do that. I hadn't mentioned this. Look at this. In 1910, black Americans were more likely than white Americans to be employers, and almost as likely as whites to be self-employed. I remember white America was being formed then. Right? You, had, you had Europeans, you had Northern Europeans and Southern Europeans. So I got all this data and I'm saying, what, 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 why we don't talk about this in 1910 and what they did? Why people don't talk about this, this entrepreneurial sector? And of course, my father was in agriculture. He was an agent too. Is Andrews. No, of course. So you look at all of this stuff and you say, what the hell we've been doing? Ron, what the hell you've been doing? Who, who's your heroes? You got the wrong damn heroes. Huh? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Heroes? I mean, what are you celebrating? 
it's all right to celebrate anything, but you cannot celebrate and realize and get rid of all of this data and realize what people did and then get the value structure and their leadership under difficult circumstances, right? Then all of a sudden, because Boogity Washington saw, we need a Negro Business League. We need a, we need a Negro Business League. I have trouble these days, Dean. I don't know if I'm, I'm a person of color or if I'm a Negro, if I'm an African American. I don't know what the hell I am. I got a crisis, right? I like, I like the term Negroes because colored people came out of slavery and, and, and created all the entrepreneurship stuff. All uh, right, Negroes built the institutions. Black Americans got the right to vote and African Americans just complained. Write that down, uh, Iran. Write that down. I like that. I like that strategy. <laughs> All right. So my point is, what the hell is going on here? All right. Because everybody, everybody was associated with innovation and entrepreneurship. Now you can go back and read my book and look at all this good stuff. What happened to it? Okay. All right, here we go. Let's dig on this. Okay. So the lessons, and I'm going to have to stop here, and we, we might pick up this a little bit. Okay. Look, I call them Miller men, truncated Miller men. They're different. Look, I can tell you this, right? There's a difference between blacks in this tradition and the new black Miller class. Okay. Because long before desegregation, they're already educated. All right. Long before. And remember that if you look at the history of this, this is that what produced the civil rights movement. Martin was a third generation Morehouse man. Pledge A5A. Abernathy was a second generation college graduate. Pledge Kappa Alpha Psi. Even Jesse Jackson was an Omega. Come on, what's going on here? Where did it all come from? It did not come from the south side of Chicago. It did not come from the east side of Cleveland, Ohio. Okay. It came from entrepreneurs, right, who understood early on, okay, that they would be criticized, right, and this is a book that criticizes it, and so it became critical. So I like to say, I wear my bouginess on my sleeve. <laughs> somebody wrote a, they, they wrote an essay, my, somebody wrote an essay straight out of Compton. I wrote an essay straight out of the black bourgeoisie. Go read it, all right? There are different traditions, okay? And you got to realize that when you begin reconstructing this thing, you got to understand the history of what oppressed people do and take their ideas to, to the market, okay? So all of the leadership, when we reconstruct this thing, this is what we have to do, okay? We got different roots. I'm so sick and tired of people saying, well, you know, I'm good because I'm, I was born in this. Nothing wrong with that. People have different experiences. Dean Andrews, I was on a guy, I was on the panel with a guy. He told me how his mama had been beaten up by his daddy, how his daddy went and ran away from home. I said, that's a good experience. But, you know, my mama wouldn't even let me play with you when I was growing up. Now, so if, I, if they can talk about their history, I can certainly talk about my history. Now, I'd be dramatic to say this, you know. You got a certain value structure that came out of all of that. Right? I want to know where did it come from? I want to know where did Sweet Auburn, anybody in here know what Sweet Auburn Avenue means? Anybody in the class? Where is Sweet Auburn Avenue and who grew up there? It was the most economically secure city in black America. Where is it and who grew up there? Sweet Auburn's in Atlanta. Martin Luther King grew up there. So did we talk about that? Does Martin talk about where he came from? 
No. Big mistake in the civil rights movement because we did not bring these values in. We were not a Johnny come lately. We had institutions and were more educated than most groups. But um, Dr. Butler, we didn't want to talk about our segregated lifestyle. Maybe that was what it was. But it's not segregation, it's homophily. Because remember, when I go back and do my analysis, the white Jews pulled away from everybody. The white Mormons pulled away from everybody, right? The Easter, because they said, okay, and, and the same thing is happening now with the Japanese and the Chinese and the Ibu from Africa. Come on. Am I right? Where am I? In, we got the Ibu on the, on, on, in the class? Huh? In the Ibu in the class? Well, I, th I think the difference, Dr. Butler, is that there were laws on the books that would dictate how you would deal with black people. That's why I'm saying more of a surrogate than, than, than a morphine that you would use. I mean, there were I laws that said that you can't and can't I do this with black folks and then they there and go to this school. Right. This is why, but the morphine is why the Jewish group became the wealthiest group in Europe. They couldn't buy land. Hitler tried to kill them all, right? Not because they assimilated, but because they refused to assimilate. And they became the white group that would dominate in, in Europe. Same thing with the Mormons in America. They burned the Mormons out because they wanted to have four or five wives. They burned them out from Chicago and they ended up in Utah as an enclave, right? And so the, the hostility was there. There was a relationship between hostility. So under, you remember, not all blacks did the same thing. So under segregation, there was homophily. Homophily just means you come together, you build institutions, okay? Uh, so if you look at different institutions, University of Chicago is, is Baptist, right? White Baptist, Notre Dame is white Catholic, Northwestern is white Methodist, Duke is, is, uh, is Methodist, right? Xavier is, is uh, private school is uh, Catholic, Dillard is it's Methodist. So coming together, homophily just means, hey, if you look at the history, right, the more the hostility, the more you turn homophily, then the better off you are in the future, okay? If you spend all your time worrying about who likes you, you're dead, which is a problem now that we're having, I think, it, certainly in my alma mater. See, uh, Dean, I want to get rid of diversity and inclusion and go back to equal opportunity because I don't know what that means. So I had an argument with Tom, who's the president of LSU. I said, we're going back to equal opportunity because everybody can't in be included with me simply because you're something else. You got to work to play golf with me, right? And the only people who were excluded were black Americans. Everybody else was included since the exception. So I'm tired of that crap. We're going back to equal opportunity because diversity and inclusion was employed by white minority groups certified by America to hijack the civil rights movement. Write that down, Donald. Put put it on, put that on, put that on the national news. All right, all right. So that's kind of my answer. Now, okay. So I'm speeding up right here. I should stop, right? Yes, sir. So, okay. so one question for you, Dr. Butler, in that same space regarding uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. So isn't the equity part a part of the inclusion? Look, here's the deal. I'm gonna tell you like I told everybody else. Equality means you have an opportunity. I don't have to like you. This is not church. You know, I debated David Duke throughout my college career. And the only thing I've asked him was a contract to make the sheets for the Klan. I could care less what he was and still could care less. Once you stop to worry about and try to re-educate somebody else, then you're dead, okay? So what I'm saying is this, it's all about opportunity, right? And, and, and remember, everything was equal opportunity. Nothing wrong with being, you know, I, you know sometimes I, you know, I can say, okay, I can self-identify as a Frenchman. You may do that, I can do that. Yeah, self-identify as a Frenchman, right? People self-identify all the time. But if you look at what happened in the business world in my world, I told all my white male friends, put your business in your wife's name and you become a minority, right? Everybody becomes a minority, and, include, and they're, but they're already there. 
Ever, nobody has been denied entrance from the University of Texas at Austin but black Americans. Nobody is. All right. Now, you can claim that, oh, you know, you got to understand this. But, you know, people get to know each other based on the contact with them, right? I mean, who would you play basketball with, right? Who would you run around with? Who would you go to class with, right? So all of my all of my friends from my undergraduate, we go to games together, right? We travel together, right? But we've had friendships since we went to college, right? In the early, I mean, nobody's gonna make me like somebody by taking a class and saying, you gotta like Ron Jackson. That's not gonna happen, right? So Ron Jackson, so what I'm saying is that if you don't get back to equal opportunity, the federal government caused something. Let me tell you something else that happened. When I went to, I tried to change, I got this thing called minority serving institutions. Wow, where'd that come from? If the University of Texas become 25% white Hispanics, then it's a minority serving school because they wanted to compete with the dollars from black universities. But remember, black Americans are so gullible and would jump in bed with anything that the federal government says is a minority and they have no interest in you at all. Nothing wrong with that. I understand that. Did that answer your question, Ron? Yes, sir, it did. I got to have some more reactions in this class. Come on, I hit, I just, <laughs> come on, I just hit a nerve. Okay, we're gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna conclude this by saying this, right? Those values, right, are different. But not just different from Black America. They're different from the other, what I call, Miller Man groups, right? Eastern European Jews, Japanese, right? Uh, you know, the Mormons. White Mormons are different because of their history of interesting, right? They're white, but they have an interesting history of oppression, right? White Jews are very different because they think Hitler's right around the corner. No matter how well off they are, they think Hitler is right around the corner, right? And so my point is that when you have those value structures, you know, how do you keep them alive? Well, they came from entrepreneurship and to rebuild the communities, you got to go back to the idea of entrepreneurship. But you need people who are who are grounded in entrepreneurial leadership. Okay? Any questions? And I, if y'all want to shoot me, I'm not standing on the damn back of the next week. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any questions? I'm going to stop, stop sharing. I, I went over my time. But, That's uh, okay, Dr. Butler. Ron, nobody's ready to go home, looks like. Everybody's, nobody's here. Uh, Brian, what do you think about that discussion? <laughs> Brian Dixon, come on, talk to me. Doctor, sorry, I was a little Zoom challenge there for a minute. Uh, I, I was actually inspired by it, sir. Uh, I really think that we really got to get everybody on board with uh, taking charge to themselves. If you're going to wait for someone to give you something, you're going to be waiting a long time. And Absolutely. I heard... Uh, I heard an interview with Shelby Steele this morning on the way to work, and uh, it just echoed strongly there that it's been hijacked. And I think um, you, know, you bring up your heroes, well, Booker T. Washington. We don't talk about him in schools nearly enough. And I think it's because the civil rights movement kind of distanced themselves from him because he just did his thing without ending segregation, and that was offensive at the time. But I think now we're in a period where we can, re we can go back and revisit those lessons, which are, they're still inspiring. Is it true that Tuskegee produced more millionaires in its time than Yale and Harvard at the same time? Absolutely. And not only yeah. that, not only that, the kids from Auburn took their science at Tuskegee. Yeah. Right. 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 So, Innovation. yeah, as a matter of fact, when I was named, I, I got the Booker T. Washington Award. I went to Washington, D.C., at the Chicago Downtown Club, and I was presented that award by five Tuskegee graduates who flew their own jets to. <laughs> to the They're South. dead all right. But nobody wants to talk about now. Now remember, we're just talking about lessons, and remember, lessons go beyond the segregation integration thing, right? Lessons have got to go, you know, to to who are your heroes. So I've been working in Shreveport, Louisiana with my good friend, John George, and we changed, we're trying to hold, you know, we put in the whole entrepreneurship stuff in Shreveport. I had 
I had 25 leaders from Baton Rouge when I was director of IC Square to come to the University of Texas, took them to Dale. We talked about a model of Baton Rouge of wealth creation and, uh, and, and, you know, and job creation. So what I'm saying is that the lessons, I mean, the lessons start with Zimmel and, and uh, the strangers. The lessons go back to uh, the ancient Assyrians, right? right. I mean, it, it goes back to what's happening in, 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 in Europe and the entrepreneurs. And if you look at America, all y'all have to do is look at who the valedictorians are, and they're going to be the first generation. It doesn't matter. It used to be, right? It used to be the, the Asians now switching to the Africans. Before that, it was somebody else because they are all children of merchants, all right? So the University of California had a problem. They had a problem because, what is it, 60% of the incoming class were Asian. Well, they said, okay. They tried to stop that by saying, okay, well, you got to have been in a glee club while you're in high school. Well, the Asians were working in their parents' shops. They were less likely to be in glee clubs. So just look at the relationship between entrepreneurship and education. And to rebuild cities, you got to put the entrepreneurs at the very, very center of everything. And we did it in Austin, Texas, you know, on the broader side. And we created a hell of a city. That is, if the city council don't, <laughs> don't tear it up now. But we made all of the entrepreneurs. We made Micah Dale a hero. Micah, Micah did Dale Computers. We did John Mackey, who just sold Whole Foods for $14 billion. We made him a hero. He was a philosopher mayor, major. Jim Tressard did National Instruments. We made him a hero. What we did in Austin was we have a whole section devoted to business, and they are our heroes. And our, and quite frankly, our governor has very little power because it's, it's manifested in the uh, Speaker of the House. Right. Any other questions? Yeah, Dr. Wester has a comment. You can go ahead and share, Dr. Wester. Hi, Dr. Berkler. Thank you so much for um, sharing this evening. I was just looking at a recent um, article, and it really speaks to what you talked about regarding opportunity. Um, it was, there was a group of people, 19 people, who bought 97 acres of land in Georgia for the purpose of building a city that was protective of the um, community. And so um, that was, I just reminded me of kind of what you were talking about tonight, um, using opportunity to your advantage, just not being trying to step out and, and, and uh, take that step of, of faith, a leap of faith. Okay, Doctor, is this Dr. Webster who played basketball at LSU? That's right, yes. Uh, one of the early basketball players, right? But yeah, well, I think he's coming through. So I'm having so many talk shows now because you got to realize this. Most Americans have never heard of this black stuff. It's been buried, right? I look at the news and, you know, I got a, I got a tiger that's on CNN. You know, the guy from on CNN, right? Don Lemon is a, you know, he went to LSU and he, and then he left and, and, and did finishing school in New York, right? I mean, there's nothing on CNN that talks about this tradition of Black America. I mean, I mean, where did it come from? I mean, everybody talks about the tradition, right? That's very, very different, right? So because you, you need to make those people who have done things the heroes and it changes the entire structure of the, of the uh, comments and I like to put the entrepreneurs at the center of everything. Now, remember, we have trouble in America now in talking about the, the, the Elon Musk and talking about wealthy people in America in general, okay? We don't have that trouble in Austin, Texas, right? But we have trouble in America in, in talking about people who create wealth, right? And as we go forward, this is going to, this is going to be much more interesting as business model change. I think universities, their business model will change. And I think that the, the pandemic will have a great impact on everything. I was talking to Verge Osbury, who was, it was at Miami, where they laid off like 30 people uh, yeah. yesterday uh, from, from athletic. So I, I think that uh, the question is, will my, my, you know, will, will my university, University of Texas, spend since, since 10, 10 million a year sending faculty to their, you know, to their annual meetings of the American Psychological Association or the American Economic Association. Uh, what's the value proposition of a, of a, of a college on, 
on Zoom. So, uh, you know, I went to graduate school at, at, at Northwestern. Northwestern is a, is a whopping 90000 a year. You know, would parents still pay that? Uh, but if not, people who would benefit for face-to-face would be the people who line up to still pay that 90000 that 100000 to go to Northwestern or pay that 50000 to go to Spelman. You got to remember that. And in, 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 in what's amazing to me, what's always been amazing to me about Louisiana, when I was growing up, there were people working two and three jobs to send their kids to St. Mary's, to send their kids to St. Augustine. Because when I grew up in Southern Louisiana, there was black Catholic, and there was black private, black public, and there was, there was white public, right? And I'm, I'm telling you probably 45% of all the blacks I knew in Southern Louisiana went to Catholic schools. There were boarding schools, right? Remember that St. Augustine had a, had, a, had a sister school for women what was the name of that school? I can't remember that school. You know, the boarding school in, in South Louisiana. And parents will work two and three jobs to, to send their kids to, to, uh, to pay the money to go to a St. Augustine or a Grandman High or a Southern High rather than a public school. So, and it was all those who were entrepreneurs in nature. Okay. Any other Thank questions? You. Any other questions for Dr. Butler at this point? Uh, Dr. Dr. Jones has it. Yes, go ahead, Dr. Jones. Would you like to read it, uh, Dr. Jackson? No, you can go ahead. You can go ahead. Okay. So, good evening, uh, Dr. Butler. My question is, I'm a descendant of the Matoire family, which owned the Melrose Plantation from 1796 to 1847. Uh, we actually met in Marksville last year at one of the events that Dean uh, hosted at the Tunica Biloxi tribe. We did. So, I spoke there with the governor and he spoke there too. I remember that. Yeah. Yes, sir. So my question in regards to that, being a descendant of the Matoire family, in your opinion, what led to the decline and the final failure of that particular black generational family wealth being passed down? Was it a lack of business know-how or failed business practices, or was it simply um, other other constructs that were in place that caused them to not be able to pass the land and other ownership down from one family to another? Well, there were two things. Now, let me just say this. Uh, the Sibylis, we used to own the land where Northwestern University sits in Natchitoches. And right. John Sibley was from Clutterville. <laughs> from Clutterville, and his church was the St. Augustine Church in Clutterville. And I had a Matoya cousin who got killed in Vietnam. He was a helicopter pilot, right? And he was from, well, what happened is, is that, so she's speaking of to the general class in, in, uh, in Northwestern Louisiana, there are two books. There's a book by Mills, who's a professor from the University of Georgia called Creoles of Color, Cane River Creoles of Color. And there's the more popular one. But you read the uh, Mills book because John Sibley, my name is, uh, is throughout. But what's happened was very, very simple. Number one, you had mechanization. You had changes in, in mechanization of what was happening. And, you know, also they fought on the, uh, they were merchants and they fought with the South during the Civil War. Okay. Uh, that population fought with the South during the Civil War. And, and, and so I think, I've looked at that and I've looked at the book. I've talked to uh, my mother uh, who, who, who grew up there, who was a Cahe, C-A-H-E-E. And so I think what happened is that you being a descendant, you remember also it was very, very different. It was isolated. So there are no Southern Louisiana's names there, right? There are no, there are no Dorsalus, there's no Abares, right? They are Matoyas, right? Uh, they are Rochelle's. They are siblings, and that's about it. Did I miss one? Right? So I think it had to do with the changes in the mechanization of agriculture. And so the wealth itself was created. And then, of course, for those who now, on my mother's side, what they say is they purchased slaves out of freedom, you know, for their freedom, right? But I have looked, I have essentially looked at the documents. But, you know, when, when that whole economy of the South failed, so there was no, there was no wealth. So if you look at what happened to uh, only 1% of whites in the South were, uh, were uh, slave owners, right? 
and what happened to the white South. Go read a book called uh, mm, 400 Years of White Trash, which goes through all of this. I can't remember her name, but the book just won some big award. It just came out. And it goes through all of that process, but I think it led to, it had to do with the mechanism and just the whole you know, destruction of the Southern way of life. So there was no wealth to pass on, right? It was all gone. Because remember now, I, 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 I drove through there and I think it is a national park now. I, I, just, I just woke up one day and, and drove to Cloutierville and looked around and then I drove to Manny because you know, Manny was a big city, <laughs> right? From Cloutierville. So I understand that process. That, okay. that's, thank, thank you, Dr. Bell. That's excellent. We're going to let Dean Andrews close us out. But before I shift to Dean Andrews, we want you folks that's on the call to know that Dr. Butler has graciously uh, uh, committed to sharing his resources with you tonight. So all of these resources in terms of the decks have been posted on the Southern University Law Center's platform. So you can access the PowerPoint slides for both presentations, except for what he just did. I'm going to get that one and I'll post that one on the Law Center's uh, website uh, uh, platform on tomorrow. Also, some folks asked last week some information around Level 5 Leadership by Jim Collins that has been posted on the platform for you as well. So, Dr. Butler, it was just a valuable, impactful, strategic conversation. We will be continuing this conversation on next week. Dr. Butler, as Dean Andrews uh, indicated at the outset of tonight's conversation, uh, is a uh, Vietnam veteran. Veteran, and we definitely will be talking about the military experience from a leadership space on next week. So you guys want to definitely come back and hear Dr. Butler just unpack for us around military. Dean Andrews? Well, I, I had a question I wanted to, to ask John. I don't want to let him uh, you know, get off so easy tonight. Uh, Oh yeah, well I just want you to think, Dean. I want I, you know me. I want I, leaders got to think about stuff they haven't thought about in years. But, but. I, I guess what I'm saying when I look at uh, you know statistics on uh, minority businesses, uh, you look at African American businesses. They have something like uh, average uh, receipts of about fifty three thousand dollars, and non minority businesses have receipts of about five hundred thousand dollars. Right. Uh, and you talked about Madam C.J. Walker, and I noticed in there, in terms of her basic principles, she talked about if you go along with this particular organization, you will benefit. Right. How, how, do, you, how do you get organizations such as this to perpetuate themselves in terms of sharing of the benefits so that people will buy in to a virtuous circle, a virtual cycle? Okay, well, let's address two things. Because remember, we got lessons. So what happens is this. The longer you've been in America, the less likely you to start an enterprise. That's the first thing. So from a methodological point of view, Black Americans who's been here for 500 years should not be compared with immigrants, okay? Because uh, Black Americans as a group do not act like immigrants, right? So, so when people say, well, you know, the Chinese, the immigrant Chinese did this, well, it's the second, third, fourth generation Chinese that you compare, not the immigrants, all right? So because in all, in all studies that looks at race, everybody who are immigrants are more likely to be self-employed. So white immigrants are more likely to be self-employed than the native born. Mexican-American immigrants, who are also considered part of white American, by the way, is also like to be, I mean, more likely to be, the immigrants are more likely to be self-employed. Now, the other thing is just the data themselves. Uh, you know that uh, I had a good friend uh, from, from uh, Georgia Tech who did a study and the receipts of black, of black business in Atlanta was larger than receipts reported in the entire survey of minority-owned enterprises, okay? Uh, so I think that there's, a because, you know, entrepreneurs really don't, lay down what they do. But remember, the deal here is entrepreneurial leadership. Because remember that the, hist the history of Black, they educate their kids away from entrepreneurship. The question is, how do we get kids back into the entrepreneurship process? And the, and the rebirth of America has always been done by immigrants. 50 to 60% of all the companies in Sil Silicon Valley, including Lifetime Fitness, including, including Google, they're all immigrant companies, all right? Uh, you know, even Facebook, right? They're, they're, you know, they're immigrant companies. So it's not, it's not from a methodological point of view. You don't compare Black Americans with other people who just got here. 
you compare black Americans who came here from other countries with other people who are also immigrants. So I think you're right. I think there's a there's a a, uh, a misnomer according to uh, uh, the economist at uh, Georgia Tech when he did the study. It just showed, but you know, how can you have the, the receipts of of black enterprise in Atlanta being total, you know, overshadowing all the receipts reported on that survey? So the survey might be interesting in itself. I guess one Remember, other one other question I had for you: How many millionaires did Michael Dell create in the Austin area? Eight hundred. I can tell you the exact number: eight hundred and ninety-seven. That's thirty million in the bank when he went public. And the reason, and the reason is that you know we we substituted share of prosperity with unions. The same thing with National Instruments. Dell, I mean, uh, Whole Foods didn't have that many, but if you if you swept the floors in Whole Foods when it went public, you walked away you know, with at least 10 million. So I think that, um, but that's a model. And we've talked about that model in Baton Rouge a lot and, uh, and trying to get it. So what, 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 what Southern has to do is do a, do a business school, right? That really stresses your relationship with science and technology and technology commercialization. How do you take all of that science and technology and commercialize it? Okay. Uh, we do a good job in Louisiana of starting great restaurant. Uh, 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 Brandon started, he did a good job. He started a walk-ons, a great, great company. Uh, we had a guy from University of Georgia who started uh, another great company around food, you know. But that's kind of our tradition. The question is, how do, how, do, how do we get to the high dollar companies like it's happening in Silicon Valley and 128 in Boston? And remember, all of those people were students. The guy who started Microsoft was a student at Harvard. Dale was a student at the University of Texas. Uh, the people who started Facebook were students, right? Uh, you know, the student effect is huge in all of this. And that has to relate to uh, how we handle a portion of our students. Now, every student is not going to be an entrepreneur. But students have all kinds of ideas. And we got to create an ecosystem in Baton Rouge, right? where you would really uh, begin to let people create companies that would create jobs in, uh, in the future. Well, I think Austin had an advantage in terms of it being a, a, a merchant culture uh, in terms of investing in the kids. I think we've got a lot of old money here, but we're not investing in the kids. Yeah, you're right. There's lots of wealth in Louisiana. I know, as I said, I chaired the, I mean, I'm on the National Foundation Board for LSU. And, uh, and uh, we rate, you know, there's a lot of wealth in Louisiana, but the difference is uh, they don't invest in, in companies, but there's a lot, you're right. There's a lot of uh, family wealth in North Louisiana and also in South Louisiana, okay? But so there, Dr. Are, Dr. People, there are people who are interested, you know, for example, I know that Richard Lipsby, a dear friend, is very, very interested in economic development all around, all around Louisiana because he's helped me with uh, with uh, face, I mean, uh, SoftBank had a hundred million dollars for black startups. Okay, so I called Richard, I called uh, Collis, and I said, "Look, I need, we need some startup from from Louisiana, right, from Baton Rouge." And he put together a team to look for uh, black startups. And I think wealth is Richard, who I think uh, his family does the, uh, you know, sell the, the 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 weapons and guns and stuff. But he has an intense interest, a huge interest in uh, in building economic development, you know, all over Louisiana, North Baton Rouge, and and uh, and all over. So you know, but the whole state has really, really need to start to invest in the kids because you know we pick up a lot of uh, Louisiana kids here uh, in the state of Texas. But you're right. So the question is, how do you do that? You got to have some early wins. But the Jaguars can do it. We can do an incubator turn the kids loose and see what happens, right? Jeffrey had a comment, Dr. Butler, Jeffrey yes, Thomas. Uh, um, thank, thank you, Dr. Jackson. Just, you were talking about the immigrants who come here and they built some of the Silicon Valley. I guess the big question is how are they able to get those investment dollars? We don't seem to pull those investment dollars in the African American community. We only get 1% of the, the venture capital funds. And so what can we do to get the money? Because we have to have some kind of capital to scale those technology or whatever kind of companies we're going to build. So we just don't get that and we need it. 
Well, there are two things, right? There are two things. Number one, they usually start with angel investors, right? So angel, I'm an angel. So angels are just wealthy people who invest in companies. So the first step is where are the angels, right? There is an angel group in in uh, in New Orleans uh, that that Jamie Rose set up. So you got to have wealthy people go together and say, look, you know, because my company was an angel group, their company was an angel group, Google was an angel group. And, you know, the VCs are not going to invest in, in you until you get to a certain standard, right? So you're going to start with family and friends, and then you get, you know, you get the company going, and then, and then they and you know, they'll invest in less than one percent of all startups. Most startups are, are angel networks, right? Uh, and and by the way, most of the the venture money is in Silicon Valley. We do angel stuff in Austin. If you need to raise. 800 million, then you get out of Austin and you go to Silicon Valley, right? So you started by doing an angel network. I would love to talk to you about doing an angel network. We have one in New Orleans, and that's just people who get together, you know, and said, okay, we're going to put 10,000, 15,000, 20,000, and, and the money is there. You can ask the other question, how, how did they do it in the, you know, at the turn of the century? Well, the angel networks, they did, they did rotating credit systems, Okay. I did, I was doing economic development in Monroe, an interesting story, with a guy named Theus, T-H-E-U-S. He had $15, 15 million to do economic development. And he said, Dr. Butler, what we're gonna do is, I said, we need to develop an incubator. He said, Dr. Butler, this, this is where we are. We have 220 churches in the black community in Monroe, Louisiana, 220 churches. I said, okay, what does that have to do with anything, Brother Theus? He said, what we're going to do is we're going to tell them we're going to build a church, then we're going to bait them and switch them and build something else. Now, his argument was that economic development was highly, there was a lot of people who were building religious institutions, which are fine, nothing wrong with that, but not committed to building other kind of institutions. So if certainly if we can, if we can, if we can build a church, we can certainly build an incubator. It's the same thing. You know, is people coming together and saying, let's do that. So I think uh, the answer to the question is you can do what you want, really want to do if you come together. And saying that you can't do it is not going to help anything. So you need to get, you know, get 400 people together. Each give, you know, $1,000, get a fund for $1,000 and invest it. So John Doggett, a good friend of mine here at the University of Texas, he went to Harvard, they had the Harvard Review. I mean, the Harvard MBA, black MBA, right? And they asked the same question. And John Dawkins said, why don't you start a fund? They had never thought about starting a fund themselves. So remember that a fund, a VC fund, is just people who invest in the company themselves. So you can, you can start a fund. If you want to start a fund in black America, you know, you get 2 million people to give, you know, $5 a piece and you got your fund. So it's more of a trust factor than anything else. And the longer you've been in America, the less that trust is. Whereas immigrants are more likely to trust each other. And then that second generation, it blows up and they become just like Americans for the most part, unless that entrepreneurship is passed through the generations. So you can create a fund, call your friends together, call all the Jaguar nation together. You know, everybody put a thousand dollars in and create a fund. And I know you can do that because I just gave, you just had a million dollar uh, campaign and I gave it that, uh, I gave it that campaign, right? Uh, so I think it's pretty wild. So I think you can do it. I would love to talk to you next time about how to do that. You know, I think you can do it. That's excellent, Dr. Butler. We certainly see the scalability of that plan and that strategy, and it certainly works. And again, we really appreciate uh, the invaluable information that you've parted with us tonight and shared with us. Uh, this conversation, uh, folks, will continue on next Monday at 6 o'clock. So let's get ready to come back and hear uh, the next generation of leadership uh, around military uh, from Dr. Butler. Again, Dr. Butler, thank you for imparting your, your wisdom and your knowledge to us tonight. Uh, and again, audience, thank you for participating. Those resources are available for you on the Law Center's platform, so reach out uh, and get those, and we'll see everybody on next Monday at 6 o'clock. Enjoy the rest of your night, and we'll see you guys back next Monday. Have a great evening, next everyone, and thank you again, Dr. Butler, for sharing. You bet. Y'all take care. Take care. Bye-bye. All right. Yes, sir.
Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Thank you, sir. Good night, folks. Good night. Thank you so much. Very good. Thank you. Have a good night, everyone. Have a great night. Thank you, Thank guys. You. Thank you, Dr. Butler. Thanks, Dr. Butler. Great presentation. Looking forward to next week. Thank you, folks.